The Cold War wasn't just a period of heightened tensions and global competition. It was also a period of rapid technological advancement and scientific achievement. And while the world was afraid that the major powers might fight a nuclear war, all over the world scientists were fighting a war over nuclei in the newly undiscovered country of attempting to identify elements that would show on the periodic table after the element fermium. The trans-fermium wars represented a rather unscientific fight over cutting-edge science. It's history that deserves to be remembered. The periodic table began its modern formulation in the middle of the 19th century, and by the early 20th century had become the primary means of organizing and understanding relationships between elements. The table was originally organized by atomic weight, but in 1913 the table was refined to organize it by nuclear charge, the atomic number. The atomic number system left obvious and discrete gaps in the table, and a handful of elements were discovered to fill in the blanks in the elements that are found naturally, between hydrogen, with atomic number 1, and uranium, atomic number 92, and the heaviest element that occurs naturally in significant quantities. The last two stable elements to be discovered were hafnium and rhenium, discovered in 1922 and 1925 respectively. The era before and during World War II saw the experimentation and use of the more unstable elements beyond atomic number 92. Plutonium and Neptunium were the first transuranic, beyond uranium, elements to be discovered, both in the winter of 1940-41 at the Berkeley Radiation Laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley. It was during his work for the Manhattan Project research that Glenn T. Seaborg theorized a new series of elements in his so-called actinide hypothesis, which led to the formulation of the actinide series sitting beneath the lanthanides. The F-block elements, now called the lanthanoid and actinoids, which we're accustomed to seeing separated from the rest of the table below the other elements, rightly belong in the 6th and 7th periods, creating a long train in the table that makes it awkward to print, leading to the convention of placing them below the table, a purely aesthetic and formatting choice. The two series have unique characteristics of chemical properties and sometimes include two elements outside of the F-block, lutetium and laurentium. During war research and in the years that followed, more actinide elements were discovered under Seaborg and a team of scientists at Berkeley Laboratory uncontested, up to fermium, named after the scientist Enrico Fermi in 1953. Two years later, the transfermium era began when the same team at Berkeley announced the discovery of a new element. According to an April 30th report in the Washington Daily News, scientists at Berkeley had successfully isolated 17 atoms of element 101 in their cyclotron. Just 17 atoms, an amount described as invisible, unweighable, almost unimaginably small. By convention, the discovery gave them the right to name it, and they dubbed it Mendelevium, after Dmitri Mendeleev, for his work pioneering the periodic table. The naming was not without a political element. Mendeleev, after all, was a Russian scientist. A French scientist told the Berkeley team that naming element 101 in honor of a Russian scientist has probably done more good for international relations than all of the politicians did. Nixon even brought it up in the kitchen debate with Khrushchev. Seaborg received a signed copy of one of Mendeleev's books from the Russians, with the note that the friendly act of the American scientist was one of the steps towards the liquidation of this absurd tenth state of Cold War. And you have to admit, that is fairly impressive for something that's invisible, unweighable, and almost unimaginably small. But Mendelevium was also representative of a new era of elemental discovery. Discoverers of an element were generally accepted as the people who got to name it, but prior to uranium, all elements were discovered somewhat naturally, and were generally named after mythological figures, astronomical objects, the minerals in which they were found, or where they were found. That changed with element 96, curium, named after Pierre and Marie Curie. These new elements were only being discovered in labs by teams of scientists, artificially forcing them into existence. <laughs> It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive. <laughs> Naming newly discovered elements after personalities, or where they were first formulated, became the norm. Until the 1980s, there were two major large labs that could create and detect these new heavier elements. There was the Berkeley Lab in the United States and the Joint Institute of Nuclear Research in the city of Dubna, Russia. In the era of the Cold War, as scientific accomplishments became a dueling field for national prestige, Discovering an element and naming it was a major accomplishment. Naming elements 95 to 101 went by without controversy. All were discovered in the United States and carried names such as Berkelium and Californium. 
dude. Since its inception in 1919, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry was the accepted international organization for approving the names of new elements. The union was the culmination of efforts to standardize scientific nomenclature that went back to the mid-19th century, and one of its primary missions was to standardize terms, measurements, and symbols. It would soon be put in the middle of a dramatic scientific brawl, a cage match in lab coats. The prelude came in 1957, when the Nobel Institute in Sweden announced that they had isolated element 102, which they proposed to call Nobelium. IUPAC quickly accepted the name. However, the discovery became mired in controversy. Berkeley couldn't reproduce the results, and later research suggested that the Swedish team had misinterpreted them. Further research led the Swedish team to retract their claim. Berkeley and Dubna continued to experiment, and both claimed to have later independently created element 102, both claiming naming rights. Berkeley chose to support Nobelium, but Dubna would instead propose Joliatium after Frederick and Irene Joliat Curie, Nobel Prize winners and daughter of Marie and Pierre Curie. Frederick was known as a committed communist. A German lab suggested Flerovium after Georgi Flerov, the head of Dubna Lab. IUPAC refused to change the name, infuriating the Soviets. Yet! Some of the disagreement came from the lab's differing opinions as to how to identify new elements and whether the methods were valid. The artificial heavy elements were produced in extremely small volumes and had extremely short half-lives, meaning they existed for only a short time even if they were produced. Credit for discovery would continue to be controversial. While the teams were battling over the creation of Nobelium, they were already attempting to synthesize element 103, with the Berkeley Laboratory making inconclusive experiments to that end in 1958 and 1960. They claimed to finally produce the element in a test on February 14, 1961. The Dubna Laboratory, however, raised several criticisms. Berkeley proposed the name Lorentzium after Ernest Lawrence, inventor of the cyclotron, and it was accepted by IUPAC. But the Dubna Laboratory claimed to have produced 103 in 1965, proposing their own name, Rutherfordium, after physicist Ernest Rutherford. The most significant disagreement was centered on elements 104 and 105, the bloody grudge match that was the core of what came to be called the Transfermium Wars. The Dubna Laboratory, led by Georgi Flerov, made the first claim to have produced elements 104 in 1964, but were unable to conclusively determine its atomic mass or half-life. They repeated the experiments between 1966 and 1969, determining a 0.3 second half-life. Current research shows no isotope of 104 has that half-life. Five years later, the Berkeley team, led by Albert Giorso, provided their own claim and evidence that they had produced the element, with more conclusive evidence found in 1970, which was then independently confirmed in 1973. The Soviet scientists didn't initially propose a name, but in the 1970s proposed Kurchatovium after Igor Kurchatov, a head of Soviet nuclear research. The name was used officially in Soviet publications. Meanwhile, the Americans instead proposed Rutherfordium after Ernest Rutherford, the same name the Soviets had proposed for element 103. That's right, they agreed that we should name an element Rutherfordium, but they disagreed over which element should be named Rutherfordium. The war over naming the elements then began to get more personal. In a 1970 paper, Flerov argued strenuously that the Dubna lab deserved the credit for the discovery in 1964, and that a 1973 IUPAC conference and other Soviet scientists claimed that research had proved once again that spontaneous fission was observed in the 1966 experiments. In 1970, the Americans published their claim for discovery of element 104 and through a scientific haymaker. The Soviets have not proposed a name for the element, so they apparently do not feel that their experimental evidence is very strong. Flerov counterpunched that, unfortunately, their examples in the history of synthesizing new elements were haste in the announcement of a discovery and naming a new element has led to a situation where a little while after the sensation, only the name was left. But the nature of it was radically revised referring to Nobelium. Element 105's discovery was just as fraught. Dubna also claimed to first produce Element 105 in 1968 and again in 1970. Berkeley scientists reported their own experiments in 1970, questioning the results from Dubna and claiming they'd produced the element independently. Berkeley scientists confidently announced the discovery of 105 on April 27, 1970, and proposed the name Hanium after German scientist and co-discoverer of uranium fission Otto Hahn. The Soviet scientists argued that they had discovered it first and instead suggested Niels Borium after Niels Bohr and later Dubnium after the city of Dubna. In 1974, IUPAC and the International Union for Pure and Applied Physics agreed to appoint a committee of neutral experts. 
three each from the United States and the USSR and three neutral countries, to consider the claims of priority of discovery of elements 104 and 105. The committee never actually met because the two groups weren't interested in a third party solving the dispute. In 1975, Glenn Seaborg and Al Giroso from the Berkeley team traveled to Dubna to attend the International School Seminar on Reactions of Heavy Ions with Nuclei and Synthesis of New Elements. There they met with the leaders of the Dubna Laboratory, Georgi Flerov and Yuri Oganissian, to discuss the disputes. The two parties disagreed about a lot of things, interpretation of data, experiment design, and what exactly qualified as a discovery. The meeting was not fruitful. Seaborg accused the Russians of not taking the Americans seriously. The following year, meetings turned downright hostile, and Yorso announced that Berkeley would no longer attempt to confirm or deny Dublin's results. We know now that it is a thankless chase and wasteful of scientific talent. The neutral committee never prepared a report, however the U.S. members did, which determined that element 104 and 105 had been discovered by the American team and that Soviet results could not be accepted, nor do any of the results published later establish the basis for their claim of priority of discovery. None of this solved the debate, and IUPAC didn't endorse any of the names. In 1979, IUPAC instead instituted a temporary system where Greek and Latin words for the atomic number were used, making element 104 un quadium, meaning one zero forium, and so on, although both sides continued to use their own preferred names. This did lead to periodic tables listing three-letter element names at the end of the table for some time. Element 106 discovery was announced by the two labs within a few months of each other. Dubna claimed to have synthesized it in June of 1974, while Berkeley scientists claimed to do so in September, although it confirmed results that they had passed over in 1971. Initially, neither side suggested a name. Several more elements were caught up in the naming dispute as well. Elements 107 and 108 also had disputed discoveries. Dubna claimed discovery of 107 in 1976, although with some discrepancies compared to later research while the German GSI Helmholtz Center for Heavy Ion Research at Darmstadt definitively produced it in 1981. The Germans proposed Niels Borium as a name in 1992, which the Dubna scientists agreed to. Dubna first attempted to synthesize 108 in 1978, but they didn't claim to have succeeded until a 1984 experiment. The GSI lab claimed to have synthesized it the same year. In 1985, IUPAC formed the Transfermium Working Group to assess the discovery of and finally determine names for elements 101 to 109. Meetings were held and research was done, leading to the 1990 establishment of criteria for the recognition of a new element. They finished their work in 1991, but results weren't published until 1993. The 1993 report officially decided that credit for the discovery of elements 104 and 105 should be shared between Dubna and Berkeley, and that 106 was discovered only by Berkeley. But that wasn't the end of it. Berkeley vociferously disagreed with the group's findings, calling them riddled with errors of omission and commission and claiming sole discovery of both elements. While the working group examined Berkeley's criticisms, it did not find it necessary in any way to change the conclusions of our report. Berkeley did, however, suggest a name for element 106, Seaborgium, in honor of Glenn Seaborg. The following year, IUPAC released a report recommending which name should be adopted to significant controversy. They refused Seaborgium outright and instituted a new rule that elements could not be named after still living people. Instead, they suggested Rutherfordium. Berkeley scientists were aghast, and Seaborg said that this would be the first time in history that the acknowledged and uncontested discoverers of an element are denied the privilege of naming it. Dubnium and Jolietium were recommended for elements 104 and 105, while Borium and Hanium were given to 107 and 108. The German lab's suggestion for 109, Meitnerium, after Lisa Meitner, was accepted. The suggestions pleased essentially no one. The Americans felt they had a right to name 106, and the Germans 108. The American Chemical Society objected to using Rutherfordium and Hanium for 106 and 108, as they were already used for 104 and 105 in American textbooks. IUPAC abandoned the rule against naming elements for living people, and instead suggested naming 106 after Seaborg, if all of the other American suggestions were removed and even proposed naming Nobelium after Flerov. This again gained support from very few people. Another meeting was held in 1996, with another set of recommendations that were finally approved in 1997. The final decision has element 105 named Dubnium, while American suggestions were accepted for 104, with a Fordium and 106, Seaborgium. 107 through 109 were given the German suggestions, Borium for Niels Bohr, Hassium for German state of Hesse, where the GSI is located, and Meitnerium, the American scientists reluctantly accepted the decision. The final naming convention did not resolve outstanding controversies over who discovered which element when and which lab deserves the greater credit. 
But after decades of disagreement, the process after naming element 107, borium, has been perfectly copacetic. The Darmstadt Laboratory synthesized the name elements 108 through 112, while 113 was created by the Riken Institute in Japan in 2003. Elements 114 through 118 were synthesized as part of a collaboration between the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory and the Dubna Laboratory, with naming rights shared between. An unexpectedly cooperative end to a story with so much antagonism, or is that antagominium? If it seems downright bizarre that presumably some of the smartest people on Earth had an argument that distressingly resembles a Twitter fight between Donald Trump and Rosie O'Donnell over the naming of elements that can only be created in a lab in incredibly small amounts and last a very short period of time, understand, as popular science writes, it is one of the most hallowed clubs in all of science to have discovered and named an element on the periodic table. Glenn Seaborg opined that having an element named after him was a greater honor than his winning the Nobel Prize in 1951 despite the fact that only a few atoms of seaborgium have ever existed, with a half-life of just two and a half minutes. And the transfermium wars might really just be in a short seas fire, because today labs around the world are competing to see who can be the first to discover element 119 and beyond. I would suggest the name Piratium, because all good stories involve pirates. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community at Locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop, book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.